It looks like it's uh, 1230 and we're ready to begin. <clears throat> so say, uh, good day and welcome to this special session directed at you, the Emeritus Professors of the University of California. My name is Jake Jacoby, and I'm the president of the Emeriti Association for this academic year, after serving a year as the vice president. And I'm happy to be able to share with you some of my thoughts about why this association exists and why I'd like you to consider joining this esteemed association of Emeriti who have decided to continue their relationship with the academic world beyond retirement. We have an executive committee that meets to assure the administrative engine that runs this program is well-oiled, well-aligned, and successful. The executive board consists of dedicated volunteers who come together from all divisions of UCSD, including Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Health Sciences, and Campus, to plan, direct, and evaluate the many programs of the association which you will learn about today. I joined both the Retirement Association and the Emeriti Association right when I retired from my full-time position back in 2010 in the Department of Emergency Medicine. After 30 years as an ER doc in the emergency room and running the disaster response program for UCSD Health. Although I've been extremely pleased that I joined both organizations as both are chock full of activities and social gatherings, even in this era of coronavirus. I am particularly pleased with two of the highlights of the Emeriti Association that have specifically played right into what I was hoping would happen when I retire. The first is the opportunity to be in the audience of a spectacular series of lectures that the Emeriti Association office offers on a nearly monthly basis during the academic year, delivered by faculty members, both retired and active, who are outstanding in their fields, and who in many instances have actually continued what we as faculty were doing our whole careers. They're the faculty who may have been your students at one time, or may have come from another institution, or perhaps they were your former collaborators on research and other projects, but they offer the intellectual stimulation and updating of knowledge that I, as an academic, do not want to miss merely because I retired and I'm no longer working full time on campus. I don't think that you want to miss these challenging, thought provoking and entertaining presentations. They will enrich your understanding of all aspects of life, science and the arts and may develop your interests in subjects far afield from your own primary area or areas of concentration. But you would but which you were always secretly interested in exploring anyway. Being a member of the Emeriti Association will keep your mind working, make retirement more fun, and make you younger. Well, maybe it won't make you really younger, but it will make you feel younger by being able to hear about the academic exploits of our UC, UC prides. The second highlight I wish to share with you, as long as I'm talking about feeling younger, is the Emeriti Mentors Program of the Association that links an undergraduate chancellor scholarship awardee student to an emeritus professor who volunteers to take on being a non-academic mentor to one of these youngins to share the wisdom and insights gained with, with these young, usually first-generation college students who represent the future of academia and the workforce. It's been a delight to share developing insights, answer questions, and advise pathways of and with the students I've mentored for the last eight or nine years in multiple areas of endeavor. Now, each of these areas will be gone over by chairs of the committees overseeing these activities. So I'm going to stop describing these programs and stealing their material. But I do want to conclude by saying that joining the Emeriti Association is one of the best bargains for your well-earned retirement dollars that is low priced. And if I have whetted your appetites to join other esteemed emeriti in the association, you don't have to wait 
until your actual retirement. You can actually join now and start getting involved with us. I'd like to now introduce someone I actually met by being a member of the Emeriti Association. Someone who I probably never would have met as we are from different campuses, different specialties. And yet I did meet him through the Emeriti Association and I consider him now to be a really good friend, the vice president of the Emeriti Association, Professor Stephen Adler. Stephen, you're on. Thank you so much, Jake. And uh... Back at you. Um, yes, uh, hi everybody. Jake is absolutely right. I've had the opportunity in uh, the last few years uh, uh, of my membership in the Emeriti and Retirement Association, since I am a member of both, uh, to meet folks whom I probably would never have met otherwise. And I really do count that as one of the uh, great uh, uh, calling cards of um, Emeriti Association membership. Uh, and similarly, uh, and I know Mark Applebaum will be talking about it uh, in great detail, the opportunity to uh, mentor an undergraduate student or students through the uh, uh, mentorship program. Um, I came to campus in 1987 uh, to join the Department of Theater and Dance. Uh, in 2004, I was appointed uh, provost of Earl Warren College and served in that capacity until 2016 when I retired from the university. Um, I, in the intervening four years, have uh, continued to be active on campus, or now virtually, uh, by teaching courses on recall and by staying involved in the life of my department. However, uh, I joined the executive committee or was appointed to the executive committee of the Emeriti Association a year ago and uh, discovered that uh, this new avenue gave me tremendous uh, opportunities to uh, diversify my own portfolio as it were uh, by participating in a lot of events uh, and intellectual life of the uh, university that I otherwise wouldn't have had the chance to do. Uh, in my capacity as vice president, I have the singular uh, honor to uh, put together a uh, list of speakers for the monthly uh, Emeriti speaker program lecture series. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to meet with active faculty, uh, typically not retirees, or Emeriti, uh, who can provide a lecture geared for a band of brothers and sisters, such as uh, the Emeriti, who are interested in a vast range of intellectual pursuits. Um, what I put together for this year, we're, uh, we're two uh, lecturers already into the series. In September, we kicked off with uh, Professor Ram Ramanathan from uh, SIO, who talked about global warming uh, and it's uh, the alliance between science, education, religion, and policy. Just a couple of weeks ago, my colleague from theater and dance, the uh, esteemed set designer Robert Brill, talked about design, how everything is designed. That was the name of his topic. Um, if you join now, uh, in addition to getting an upright Lewitt vacuum cleaner or a nine by 12 rug, um, sorry, that was a, an, uh, from a commercial from New York City local TV um, from the early 1960s. Um, uh, our uh, new dean, founding dean of the School of Public Health, Cheryl Anderson, will be talking about perspectives on public health. Uh, we. Uh, don't have a speaker in December. That's the Joint Emeriti and Retirement Association holiday party. Uh, but we may have some interesting entertainment for you. Um, in January, it will be uh, Kathy Gear uh, from the Department of History talking about property, psychology, and the environment in a warming world. In February, it's Professor Trey Eidecker from uh, School of Medicine talking about artificially intelligent models of cancer for diagnosis and treatment. In March, it's Kim Cooper from the 
department uh, from the uh, Division of Biological Sciences, uh, talking about how and why the gerboa got its long feet. In April, it's uh, Amelia Glazer from the Department of Literature talking about songs in dark times, Yiddish poetry of struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine. And in May, we end the seasonal uh, lecture series with our special emeriti lunch, virtual or not, um, uh, which is a big ceremony. And our featured speaker for that is uh, sometimes uh, guest uh, faculty in the Department of Political Science. You may have seen him on many different talk shows on MSNBC and other outlets, Harry Littman, talking about uh, uh, restoring the judicial process in a post-Trump era. And um, I know we don't talk about politics here, so we'll see when that post-Trump era actually begins. Um, at any rate, that's what we have on tap for this year. I think it's an interesting variety of speakers from different uh, uh, from different worlds, uh, different academic disciplines. And thus far, I think everybody has been really pleased with um, how it's progressed uh, over the first two. So um, uh, thank you again. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to bring this to you today. Um, and I would now like to uh, pass the virtual mic uh, to uh, my uh, good pal and um, father of a student whom, uh, well, not a student uh, of mine, but uh, turns out that his daughter uh, was uh, an intern uh, at, when she was at Torrey Pines High School uh, at La Jolla Playhouse 32 years ago when I stage managed my first show there. Um, it's my friend from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Bob Knox. Well, thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, and uh, yes, Leela remembers those years finally as you do. Um, I've been at Scripps since 1973, came there from a postdoc at MIT. Uh, nobody's ever showed me a good reason to leave, and so here I still am. I retired uh, in 2006, but then had a couple of uh, ricochets back into active service for a period of a year or two here and there, and finally been retired, fully retired since the uh, latter part of 2009. Uh, and I I think Jake said earlier that he was not inclined to uh, steal a thunder from subsequent speakers, but between Jake and Stephen, they've done most of that. So I'm going to be very brief. Uh, like them, I joined the Emeriti Association and subsequently the Retirement Association in order to stay in contact with the, the rich uh, life of UCSD in various forms. And um, I've been surprised and delighted to see how that's played out. The lecture series that Stephen outlined is certainly one of the major draws. If you look uh, back in the web information or other sources, you can get a whole litany of uh, talks back through the years, such as the one that Stephen outlined for this year, and you get a sense of the, uh, the variety of high-level intellectual pursuits at this university across the board, all, all pieces of the university. <clears throat> and like both Stephen and Jake. The other part of it that's been very satisfying to me has been participation in the Emeriti Mentoring Program. You're gonna hear a lot more about that from Mark Applebaum shortly, so I won't say a great deal about it, except to say that it really is uh, an amazing piece of what this association does. And that specific aspect, the, the mentoring program for Emeriti people to engage with current students is I believe unique to this campus at this stage of the game. Mark can say more later on, but it really was invented here by Professor Mel Green. And I've been a participant now for about six years and it's, it's been a delight. Uh, the contacts with those students may start in the first year that they're here, but some of them continue on right through the four years and beyond post-graduation. So you make of it what you will, but it is a great way to stay plugged into what the next crop of leaders of this university in this country are up to as they enter into UCSD. The other piece of the puzzle that the, the past president, my current slot, has to take on is the awards of various kinds for colleagues. You can look on the Emeriti website uh, webpage 
at UCSD under the tab for awards and learn a lot more about it. There are sort of three main categories, the so-called Panunzio Award that's administered at UCLA. There's the UCSD Revell Medal that we have a piece of the action in, but the main thing that falls entirely to the Emeriti Association to head up and eventually um, select a winner or winners is the so-called Dixon Award. Uh, there's a fund that was set up by Regent Dixon to uh, make awards to Emeriti who are continuing to be uh, an impact in service in teaching and research post-retirement. And so we get to carry the football on that one uh, from start to finish. And I commend it to your reading on the, on the webpage to see what it's all about and to thinking about colleagues of ours that uh, are worthy of that award. It's an impressive list of prior winners. Uh, so it's, it's pretty fast company, but we have uh, in our, our uh, ranks of retired uh, academics at this university, a lot of uh, pretty extraordinary material. So do please give that a look and think about it. And now I will hand over to whoever's next. I'm blanking on who that might be. Um, Hi, all. I, I think it's me if I'm I looking at the right, list. Mark, right. you, I'm sorry. I just lost the bubble there for a minute. Go ahead. That, that's fine. Hi, I'm Mark Applebaum. I'm a emeritus professor. Um, many of us, most of us are here. Um, and this year and last year, I've chaired the Emeriti Mentoring Program. Um, I am emeritus from the Department of Psychology. I'm essentially a quantitative psychologist and applied statistician, that sort of thing. Um, for a bit of a while, I was what was then called Associate Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education. It's now called um, Dean of Undergraduate Studies, I believe. And Barbara Sari, who I see here, succeeded me in that position. And she has now completed that uh, phase of her life, and we're hoping that among the rest of you here, you will join the Emeritus Association and get to know about the Chancellor Scholars Program and the Emeriti Mentoring uh, Program. Let me tell you just a little bit about the Chancellor Scholars Program. It is a combination of several different things. At one level, it is a financial aid package. The uh, students who become chancellor scholars are selected uh, by financial aid based upon um, their criteria of the students being, uh, we'll talk about very gifted, but they are uh, blue uh, gold eligible. That is, they uh, are in that group of students who get financial aid, complete uh, financial support for four years of college based upon basically parental income. They are in most regards, first generation college students and they come essentially from what used to be considered lower resource schools. That's changed a little bit at this point. Um, basically what happens is our students, the Chancellor Scholar students, are selected from the same pool of individuals who become regent scholars or chancellor uh, associate scholars. Um, so they have essentially, you know, sort of that group of students who have, uh, before the fact, some special uh, considerations. Uh, old educational theory said these were students who were, you know, at risk of not uh, doing extremely well. The difference is our kids are selected because they did very, very well. So at any rate, every year, 40 students are selected to be in the Chancellor Scholars Program. And one of the pieces of the Sco Chancellor Scholars Program is that they then become, of, the, of that award, is that they then become part of the Chancellor Scholars Group and the Chancellor Scholars, the program, which is run by Suzanne and Vanya, essentially has a whole series of events that are to 
bring them up to uh, speed actually to give them some advantages into kind of knowing how the campus works. One part of that program is that each of them receives a mentor, okay? None of the other programs of, of the same type have mentoring as part of the uh, benefits of being in the program. Uh, 40 of them a year, they're in the program actively and receive mentoring for two years so that at any given point, we have about 60 chancellor scholars who we mentor. Who are the mentors? Well, you see some of them here. Some of you I very much hope will find it interesting and become uh, mentors. Uh, the mentors come about in equal number from academic affairs, the academic departments, health affairs, and uh, then we have about a third of the individuals who are special university people who've had experience as uh, various roles within the university that are not narrowly faculty roles. So we have people like Phyllis Mursky, who's here, who librarian of uh, many years and lots of involvement with students. Uh, Mae Brown, who some of you may know, uh, she was director of admissions here. So we have mentors from these various groups. We, uh, this year, obviously, it's a little bit different. We're learning a whole lot about how you mentor remotely, how you interact with students that you do not see face to face. Uh, we hope by, you know, in the not very distant future, that will change and we'll go back to our usual mentoring routes. But the main thing is what we do is we're there for these very gifted, and I mean, they really are very talented students, kind of as, uh, I was gonna say parents, but the reality is, is grandparents who are kind of there just to allow, give the students some adult individual who's experienced with the university, with various aspects of the university, who aren't their parents. And so people that they can talk with, they can bring up issues. We also do a lot of stuff to make sure that they're aware. Uh, that was my five minute warning, so I better get done with it. Uh, to make sure that they're aware of all the various things that are happening, not all of them, but a lot of the things that are happening on campus. Um, among the things that we do, in addition to what we do directly with our students, we have uh, what is called First Monday. It is a meeting the first Monday of every month, except when the first Monday of the month isn't uh, the first, you know, it's a holiday or something. And it's just a really informal, meeting where uh, we talk with each other about our experiences, what is happening, offer some suggestions. Uh, every other one of those, about four of the Mondays out of the year, maybe five, we bring in a speaker to keep us up to date on things that are happening within the university. Um, one thing, and then I will shut up, we are not advisors. Every student has their academic advisor who works with them about you know, graduation requirements and all of that. As a matter of fact, all that's pretty much electronic now. Um, my, my now junior mentor, uh, mentee, uh, prided himself on never seeing a, his college advisor because his claim was everything was online, you could find everything. But the important thing is that we are not their um, advisors in the sense, we do not have to know in detail, you know, all of the stuff that they have to have in order to be able to graduate and that kind of thing. We really are mentors. And um, for many of us, this is the major, major involvement we have 
through the Emeritus Association. We go and listen to talks and what have you. And by the way, the program is really good at keeping us informed of various things. But for about 50 of us, uh, that's the number of people who are currently active Emeriti mentors. It is one of the major activities we have. Um, I'm going to shut up because I was told to talk for five minutes and it's been five minutes. We're going to have some time for questions. And so after everyone speaks, we can come back and do some questions. And I am now going to pass it off to Harry. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello? Um, can you hear me? Uh, for some reason, I can't hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So um, I'm very happy to be part of this panel. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is how um, our Emeriti Association fits in to a larger association involving the other nine campuses. Um, I've had the good fortune to have worked at UCSD uh, from uh, 1971 up until uh, taking retirement in 2012 and uh, going straight back into um, teaching and um, providing consultations and doing the usual things. But um, retirement gave me an opportunity to um, meet an entirely new group of people, all of our colleagues uh, who have also uh, joined the Emeriti Association or are members of the Retirement Association or both. Now, uh, during the last uh, 50 years, two of the most interesting years were spent up at the Office of the President um, as Chair of the Academic Council. Um, so uh, what happened uh, basically was to be able to discover that uh, a 10 campus system is even more interesting than the very good campus that uh, we all belong to. Uh, a 10 campus system that goes back 150 years um, includes uh, some really extraordinary institutions. So um, this week um, I'm going to be um, chairing an organization called the Council of UC Emeriti Associations. And our colleagues from the other campuses um, will all be represented at that meeting. Of course, like so many different things today, our meeting will be virtual. Um, the benefit of that, I suppose, is that we're saving some money and uh, maybe polluting the environment a little less since we're neither flying nor driving. But the challenge is during the time of a major pandemic and uh, during a time of economic um, convulsions, um, it's very important to maintain the institutions of this university, which go back as long as um, the 150 years ago when it was first founded. Um, so I first became aware that was a, a system-wide institution for retirees when I would get uh, the triennial report uh, describing the activities of retirees and realizing that those activities spanned um, all the things that we did uh, when we were uh, salaried by the university and uh, many of which uh, people continue to do. So people who are in the emeriti uh, category um, have grants, do teaching, do all these other things. But we also do what we were trained to do through the institution of shared governance, this unique thing at the University of California, which gives the faculty a voice in how the entire university is run, not only in uh, teaching and awarding of degrees, but spanning the entire range of activity. So um, within the last three or four years, I've had the opportunity to work more closely with an extraordinary academic citizen, 
John Vose from UC Davis, who um, has a background in communications, uh, journalism, and statistics, and who uh, elected to run the triennial review of what we all do. Um, he began to realize that the traditional way that this was done uh, could be improved upon. And so he found a way of presenting all the information about uh, the activity of retirees in one big report. And he calls that report the virtual 11th campus, because what he's saying is that the retirees, the emeriti, the people who remain active are a dynamic part of the University of California. We are a virtual 11th campus and we are a resource uh, to the whole uh, university system and to the state. It's a wonderful thing to get to know so many interesting new people in that um, uh, venue. And so um, I would like to thank everyone at UCSD who supported me, uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to be a mentor, uh, to be uh, chair of the mentor organization and to working with uh, Suzanne and Vanya and the extraordinary students that we have uh, in our program. And so I am very grateful for all these opportunities. Thank you all. Hi, my name is Roger Sprague and I think I am on next. Um, I joined the medical school here in 1969, finished my training, joined the faculty, retired in 2006 and joined the Emeriti Association as a way of staying in touch with uh, the university in a variety of ways. And I see David Gus and David Ward and Paul Inser all on this call. And I have to just say hello a little hello to my friends from many, many years of uh, service in the trenches. Um, about six or six years ago, I think, there was a question put out, what else could the Maritime Association be doing? And I said something about how it might be fun to have a book club. And that was taken back to the executive committee. And I think Joel Dimsdale at the time came back to me and he said, yeah, people think that would be a good idea and why don't you try to make it happen? Uh, and he was a good administrator. So I, I took that on. And I think book clubs in general or clubs in general have a lifespan. This one has seemed to have legs and has really uh, been very, very um, successful, I think over the last six years, meets once a month the goals were to have it be for both men and women. Women have been much better in general at running book clubs and making them uh, succeed than men, but, but the men are trying. Uh, it's been wonderful because, well, there are some people from the medical school. There are also members who contribute from theater and dance, from political science, from literature, from psychology, from physics. And having those people all together discussing interesting books has, has just been great. Meet once a month. We used to meet at the faculty club, but now with Zoom, it's been uh, easy. There's parking is no longer a problem. I spend a third or a half to a half of my time in Northwestern Montana, but meeting from there through Zoom is, is no problem. The uh, books that we discuss are anything that the discussant thinks might be of interest. So uh, fiction, nonfiction, there's been a fair amount of focus on history, World War II history. Uh, I can say the book that we just uh, discussed yesterday was The Sixth Extinction, which uh, was very interesting. Not, not a lighthearted counterpoint to other things that are going on in our lives these days, but it was fun. Uh, we've had a couple of, of presentations where the author of the book has been invited to participate. Sachit Panda um, was with us and talked about his book on the circadian code recently. So this, this is continuing to go on and I, 
think it's been an important part for my experience in the in the organization. The other, th and I can send if anybody's interested, I can send a whole list of the books that we've we've talked about over the years. The other thing that that Suzanne asked me to mention was my involvement with the mentoring uh, effort that you've just heard about. And I've been doing that for about 10 years and it's been very rewarding in a couple of ways. One has been the opportunity to learn something about the undergraduate experience here, which I had almost no view of at all as a, as a member of the medical school faculty. And just getting to know the kids, what uh, their life is like here has, has been fascinating. I've had a couple of mentees who have struggled and I think looking back at it, at one of them and dealing with the other one who's currently a student, that having somebody who's got gray hair and they can talk to and, and give them some advice probably has been pretty helpful in, in their dealing with, uh, with the problems that they're having. And that's been a rewarding feeling as well. So I would second everything that Mark has said about the mentoring program. I'm gonna pass this along now to Phyllis Mursky, who I think has been a past president of this association and also has had a lot of involvement with the mentoring program. Thanks, Roger. Yes, I am the past past president. Uh, I was president uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, basically, what I want to talk about, other than the fact that I've been part of the Emeriti Association almost since retiring, which was in 2005, I think, Oh, I should say, you can probably tell from the background there, that's the library. That's where I spent the bulk of my career. But I do wanna talk about the mentoring program. And as Mark mentioned, many of our mentors come from various segments of campus, not only the academic departments or, or the medical school or scripts, but the colleges as well and the library as well. Librarians are academic, non -synonym. One of the things I discovered when I got involved with the mentoring program was that many of our students are STEM students, uh, many of them engineering students, which is not unusual for first generation students. I think uh, the, the research shows that a lot of first generation students turn to, to engineering and, and other mathematical because it's easier if English is not your first language usually to go through the, the math route. And so I thought, well, what can I bring to this table? I'm, I'm certainly not a STEM major. And I think one of the things I discovered, and I think a couple of my colleagues have mentioned it, is having the ability to listen, knowing about campus, not being their parents, but being in loco parentis, which when I was a student many, many years ago, was a derogatory term for my university. No, I think it makes sense. Uh, students come, they're dumped in a school with 30 plus thousand students and trying to navigate that is hard. And I think the, the mentors play a role which is different from parents and advisors and teachers and it's important role. So those of you considering it, I hardly, highly encourage you to do so. And I don't know who's next. Actually, Jake, you can field questions now if anyone has a question. Sure, thank you, Phyllis. And uh, thank you to all the other speakers as well. I think that uh, Roger mentioned the third thing that I would have mentioned if I was given more time, uh, because I really enjoyed the book club, even though I can't make it every time. But it really has had broadened my reading list and the quality is, is great. So um, I've enjoyed it tremendously and highly recommend that activity once you do sign up. So there's a couple ways we can do questions. I will keep my eyes out, although it takes uh, two screens to see everybody. So raising your hand, I might miss it uh, transiently. You can by clicking on the participants uh, and then uh, clicking to raise your hand. 
and hopefully uh, Vanya and or Suzanne, along with myself, will monitor to see if there's hands raised. And then you can unmute yourself and we can see if we can answer your questions. And I see the first question is from, uh, I think that's a hand, no, that's not a hand raise, is it? No, it's not. I see a hand raised from Phyllis Mursky. He didn't get enough time to talk. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh, uh, we have a few people who I don't know, and I'd be interested in what departments some of them are from and are they retired or planning to retire? Well, that's a good uh, observation. And uh, I guess we could sort of uh, do that uh, in, in the absence of other questions. And so let's, so I've got a list and I'm sure that it's not the same order as your list, but uh, we can go down the row here. Uh, actually, why don't we just leave it open? If any of you who are, here for the first time and learning about the Ameritai Association because you're interested. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand so that we can have you uh, give us a capsule of where you're coming from and, and what your impressions are. Uh, and I see the first hand that goes up is uh, David Gus, my former director from the Department of Emergency Medicine. David, you're on. Hi, everybody. Um, as uh, Jake already indicated, um, I'm a physician, uh, emergency medicine. I actually started out in internal medicine. I came here as a resident in 1976 and uh, joined the nascent department and faculty of emergency medicine in 1979. Uh, did many things over that period of time. Um, and it, in the mid 1990s became the then director of the department and took the department to uh, academic department status and was the chair for several years until I retired in 2013. Um, I'm a happy retiree, I'm happy with my life up until about March of this year uh, as things change for all of us. Um, and while I say I'm happy as a retiree, the, I can't stand that term retiree or retirement because I think it's a complete mischaracterization of our lives once we move on from what we may have done uh, as our primary uh, uh, avocation or vocation. Anyway, um, I'm sort of amazed. It's been seven years and I never thought to join the organization or to pursue some of the uh, opportunities and I'm very much looking uh, to doing that going forward. Well, thank you, um, David, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing if you, um, you do uh, want to join with us. I've been extremely happy here. Uh, I'm still working part time, as you know, I still work at the Hyperbaric Center. And, and although I only worked, uh, I only worked three or four days a month at, at the most, uh, and I'm still active as a federal employee doing DMAT, but this is still something that uh, has added a lot to um, my retirement. <laughs> um, and you're right, you don't really, you don't really retire from an academic career and you don't really retire as a physician either. So um, anyhow, thank you for your comments. Uh, let's see, do I see any other hands here? Let me switch screens here and see if, uh, I see one from Leslie Bruce. Uh, unmute yourself. Yes, I think, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, I worked with you, Jake, a long time ago and David Gus as well, when I had first started as Director of Government and Community Relations for the Health Sciences. Um, after a while of doing that, Grace Miller, who's also on this call, lured me over to extended studies and I began to not only build programs there in the extension, um, healthcare related um, career um, training like um, medical writing and medical coding and nursing programs and things like that. 
Um, I, I began to teach in the School of Medicine's two master's degree programs, one of which was leadership of healthcare organizations, and the other one was health policy and law. So I taught in those, um, particularly um, did a lot of teaching of US uh, politics and public policy of US healthcare. So um, I did that for quite a long time and then retired fully at the end of last year. And I taught again this year, but that's my uh, story and I'm sticking to it. Well, that sounds great. You know, uh, I, I used to see a lot of emails from you, but it was, it was always difficult to pin the face on the, on the email address. And it's a lot easier now. So thank you, Rona, uh, uh -huh. for something. That's right. <laughs> Um, okay, did I see another hand somewhere? Grace Miller, you got mentioned by Leslie, so you get your two minutes. I did, and I, I was really honored to work with Leslie for a number of years. I started out at UCSD in 1974, ordering supplies in the Special Care Nursery Research Lab for Dr. Lewis Gluck, if any of you remember him and um, then transitioned over to the medical center where I ultimately became director of training and development and then um, was recruited by UCSD Extension to start their healthcare and behavioral sciences department, which I did, and then retired officially in 2018, but then went back for another six months after that to continue working on something called the post-baccalaureate pre-medical program um, went back in 2010 to get my doctorate in education, which I did through UCSD and now teach pro bono for them. Uh, so it's been a, a, a wonderful career with UCSD and honored to be part of the Emeriti Association and would love to join the book club, Roger. So anyway, that's my story. Great. Super, thank you. And uh, I saw a second hand go up in the corner of my eye. David, David Ward. Uh, it's nice you. to see a lot of uh, well-known faces from the medical school. And um, this is my first time tuning into the Emeriti Association. I joined the Department of Medicine in 1975, having come to San Diego from Scotland two years pr prior to do a second fellowship at Scripps Research. And um, I officially retired in 2017, but I've actually been pretty busy on the part-time side until this summer when I finally stopped seeing, stopped doing most of it in the end of July. So, it, and then I spent most of the summer in Oregon where we have a second home and now I'm back in San Diego. So it's, uh, that's my story for why I'm now beginning to uh, look at the Meritai Association and his activity, activities, and I'm hoping to be involved in quite a few of them going forward this winter. Um, I'm, I sort of haven't explored it very much, so uh, I'm going to be finding out what I want to do. I'm still doing a lot of teaching. I just did 10 hours of teaching in the last two weeks online, and um, still working on some of the immunology research and stuff that. Uh, I've always been interested in, my background is in kidney disease. So anyway, thank you for uh, letting me gate crash this uh, meeting, which I did at the last minute. And um, I'm uh, gonna see more of you, I hope. Thank you. I think Paul Insel had his hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, I've been at UCSD since 1978. <clears throat> I came from UCSF where I spent uh, four years before that. So it meant after 40 years, I was um, fully vested. So I went, took retirement in 2017, but I actually haven't retired. Um, I've been the director of the MD PhD program through the medical school and the general campus and nearby, organ, um, nearby institutions uh, since 1989. And um, I'm still co-director and oversee 85 students. So I don't feel very retired from that point of view. And moreover, one of the reasons I retired was I wanted to explore the private sector and I worked part-time for Merck Research Labs for two years after officially retiring. And then, um, surprise of surprise, I continued to get grants 
and I just got two grants, so I'm still have a research lab, although it's kind of small. So I, I'm sort of retired, but I don't really feel I am, but I, I've heard about this organization. I'm, I've never had any contact before, and much like my friends and colleagues from, from the med school, such as Roger and David and David Gus, both David, and uh, David Ward, um, you know, I thought maybe it's time to sort of check it out, and Henry Powell, who I know, too. So mm. I'm looking forward to, to learning more and perhaps participating when time becomes a little more available. And hello, Barbara Sari, who I saw yesterday at my house because she's in my wife's book club. Mm. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you. Uh, you know, it's sort of interesting. <clears throat> when I had to give my talk as the president of the Emeriti Association, I went and looked up the word emeritus and and read the history of the word and 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 one of the academic definitions that kept coming up is that it was that was it was an appointment but it didn't mean that you had to give up your office your research grants or your work it was it's just sort of like a point in your life and i think that a lot of us here realize that so it's just hard to cut the cord i think with uh with the mother institution so uh, thanks for your comments. And, totally uh, I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, and obviously we don't want to we don't want to uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of brainwash you and 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 try to sell you a bill of goods. I think that the issue here is that it actually really does have the characteristics of an organization that you'd want to join after you retire from university, but you want to still keep your connection to the university. And uh, uh, Harry Powell, who was who was a um, a neuroscientist, neuropathologist for many years, and and I'm amazed that every time he opens his mouth, he's talking about something else. He's got he's like a Renaissance man here, and and he has a most wonderful uh, series on on uh, on history of music and 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 the composers and and uh, it, it's just fascinating to see and to hear about all the different interests of the kind of people that we've been associating with all our careers. Thank you very um, much. Well, there you go. Thank you. And could I uh, say, I was delighted to hear the name of Lou Gluck. Um, he was one of the people that I wrote one of my very first papers with back in the early 1970s. And of course, he was a very famous neonatologist, and it was a lot of fun to work with him on a project uh, about physohex and the injuries that hexchlorophene can cause in the nervous system. Also, I should mention uh, to Dave Gus um, that I don't like to say retiree, I prefer to say fiscally retired, but not physically retired, and hopefully not mentally retired. Uh, so um, these are some of the, it's great to see so many faces, um, Paul and um, Dave and David Ward, and uh, it's, it's great. Uh, it'll be well worth it to all of you to have joined this marvelous organization that we've got. Jake, I think Barbara Sowery has her hand up. Oh, okay, well then speak up there. It's to you, Barbara, unmute yourself. I'm outside on my deck, so uh, there's a lot of outdoor noise. I won't talk for long, but it's nice to see everybody. Uh, many folks I haven't seen in a little while, although I did just see Paul yesterday. Uh, I am, am retired now three years. Uh, am Professor Emerita from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And the last 10 years of my time at UCSD, I succeeded Mark Applebaum and was the Dean of Undergraduate Education. Uh, I am a member of the Emeriti Association, but have not had time to become involved uh, now that there's still no travel and uh, uh, doesn't seem to be for the foreseeable future. I have additional time and decided to find out what the committees were all about. And that's why I tuned in today. Well, that's great and welcome. Uh, I saw Stephen, you had your hand up? No. All right. Uh, how are we doing on time here? We've got about five more minutes uh, that was programmed. Um, so, are there um, are there other 
questions or observations here. It's nice that other people are interested in the book club. We do have a, a reasonable turnout. Um, when, <clears throat> when we were not doing it virtually, we would meet and, and uh, get lunch, the faculty club, and, and, uh, and sometimes the discussion before or after the book club material <laughs> was, was even more interesting. Uh, because of the, the broad subject matter that everybody seems to have brought with them to the Emeriti Association. So um, I've been extremely pleased with uh, all of my new friends here. And it's, and it's good to see the old ones as well. Okay, and uh, I, I'm wondering whether uh, either Vanya or Suzanne would like to make some comments uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, perhaps I, maybe making. I think maybe you guys making... have all covered it. I would just uh, urge everyone to look at the website, uh, emeriti.ucsd.edu, where you will see additional information about each of the sections which was described today um, and then just to let you know I mean it's not no one's pushing anything on anyone but as a follow-up of course we have all your emails and so we will send you a follow-up email um, inviting you to join if you haven't joined and those of you that are interested to bec in becoming mentors, uh, please do let us know because we're always looking to bring in new mentors to the, to the group. If, if I can add, if any of you have any questions about the mentoring program, please be, feel free to contact me and I'll uh, be happy to chat with you. Also, a bunch of people here like Henry have been uh, you know, it shared it before me, it changes every two years. But if anyone wants any to chat, just, you know, let me know. I'm happy to talk about the program. How do we reach you, Mark? Mark, you're muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, send me an email. It's M A P P E L E before the L B A U M at ucsd.edu. Perfect. Set up a Zoom meeting if you want to you know, and just be able to chat. Thank you. <clears throat> for those of you uh, from the medical side, from UCSD Health, even though I'm from UCSD Health, in the last six years, I've had one pre-med student. I've had uh, a couple of chemical engineering students. I've had a couple of mechanical engineering students. <clears throat> I had one, actually one pre-med who, who changed their, their major about two weeks after arriving as a freshman and wanted to switch to just doing data science. And, um, and so the, the issues that come up um, are still valuable for somebody from our experience to help with. Many of the issues are related to uh, issues with, with roommates, with, with, with uh, organization of time to study with tips on, on how, to, how to get rest and, and how to spend weekends. These are a, a very much students who don't have, many of them do have older siblings who may have just entered college before them, but they haven't had a lot of experience or opportunity to talk with their older siblings. But they, they, do, not, they do not have any college experience and it's very often being away from home for the first time. And so these are some of the issues that, have, that I've seen that need to be discussed. The other issues, of course, once coronavirus started, I've been impressed with the number of problems that people have had 
trying to do college courses while living at home virtually when they have siblings who are in bands who need to practice uh, instruments and, and uh, it's very distracting for them. And it's a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be to be involved in college level courses when you're at home on a computer. So there's been an interesting way of transfer of information from, for me as the older generation to the younger folks and from the younger folks, what they're experiencing now has been very interesting and helpful for me in counseling some of the students that I've had afterwards or that I will have afterwards. Um, I think we're at uh, 1.30 and we don't want to take up too much of your time. You probably all have other seminars uh, that you have to <laughs> attend on the hour. So I'd like to thank you very much for your interest. I'm also available if you'd like to ask me questions. And my email address is just ijacoby at health.ecsd.edu. And even if you forget the health, it still gets to me. And um, I'm very happy to see a lot of my old colleagues and friends um, uh, looking interested at the Emeriti Association from UCSD. Thank you very much for joining us.